larger context um, that we are uh, experiencing right now. And uh, I was just talking to colleagues um, about the events in Buffalo uh, over the weekend. And I wanna acknowledge that for so many of us, uh, the, these painful reminders um, about the, um, you know, the vileness of, of racism um, and, and hatred are all too frequent um, in, our, in our world, in our nation. And so that constant having to, you know, live our, live our everyday lives to be, um, you know, to be family members, to be friends, to be employees, um, and to have to, to live your life um, while also trying to um, balance kind of that burden, uh, that really painful burden uh, of these, these reminders that come up, um, you know, related to violence and racism in our country can be really difficult. So I want to acknowledge that for the room. Uh, I want to encourage you to take time for yourself, to love on yourself as much as you can, to love on others as much as you can. Um, as we continue, unfortunately, to experience these types of uh, violence. So um, I think it would be um, remiss if we did not address that for, for ourselves. Um, and also to anchor uh, this work, this work we're talking about equity and we're talking about racial equity um, and making uh, connections and building relationships between people uh, and centering people of color. Um, and it's so timely, right? It's always timely, but uh, unfortunately uh, we had a, a violent reminder of just how critical this work is um, and the reasons that we do it. So um, I welcome, before we get started, any uh, thoughts uh, or comments or anything anyone would like to share uh, related, to, uh, related to this reflection. I just wanna open space for that. There's no pressure to, but I wanna open space for that. I'm reading the chat. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I, I can I can read um, Monica's comment for those who maybe uh, can't see it. Uh, and Monica says, I wonder a lot, what would it look like if we were able to actually grieve the injustice and despair of the racist mass casualties we experience so often? Uh, and yes, that's, um, that's a resonating thing to, to ponder. So thank you for letting me uh, reflect a little. Thank you for letting me share with you. Um, and we will move into this. We will move into this uh, significant work that we're doing um, and uh, remind ourselves of the, the people we're serving and the world that we are attempting to, to reshape. Uh, so I want to begin by um, uh, letting you know that Ha Huynh can't join us today. And Ha is the Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at the State Board uh, and my incredible supervisor. Uh, and we usually um, host these sessions together, but she's unable, she has a, a work conflict. And so today I'm facilitating and hosting. Uh, fortunately, you won't have to hear from me very much of the time uh, because we have some incredible presenters and speakers who are going to share with you uh, the work of, um, um, some tribal relations connections uh, with the work of the state board and also um, some guided pathways connections. Uh, and then we have colleges that are gonna highlight the work they've done with their DEI strategic plans related to uh, state bill 5194, Senate bills 5194. So we will move into uh, the slideshow and Christina, if you can pop that up. I'll get going. Thank you so much. And this session is um, will be repeated on the 23rd. So we offer um, 
Uh, we've offered several different info sessions related to uh, Senate Bills 5194 and 5227, uh, and we offer them twice so that folks maybe can, um, can see those that they've missed. We're also recording this so that it can be made available to folks later. Um, but we will have a repeat of this session on the 23rd. Uh, some guests who are not able to join us today, some speakers who are not able to join us today will be able to join us on the 23rd. Uh, so the programs might look a little different, but they're basically structured the same way. All right, so next slide. I want to introduce some of us here. So I mentioned Ha, uh, who is our Director of Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion at the State Board. I am Melissa Williams. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a the policy associate for EDI team. Uh, and then I'll let Christina introduce herself. Thank you, Melissa. My name is Christina Pleasance. I serve as the Administrative Assistant for the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Office here at the State Board with Melissa and Ha. I've been here about seven months. And I'm truly grateful to be a part of a wonderful team and a wonderful agency. Um, I am a second generation Asian American and a first generation university graduate. Although I'm still learning, I hope to make a difference within this work and in our communities, especially in education moving forward. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Christina is amazing, fantastic. Um, colleague and keeps us on track. We, we could not, we could not do the work, huh? And I could not do the work without you. Uh, so thank you. And then I'll turn it over to our colleagues who will uh, be speaking today. Uh, Lynn uh, Palmentier Holder uh, cannot be with us. She has a conflict, but um, um, her some of her information will be presented on her behalf. Um, uh, but I will turn it over to Monica to introduce yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Monica Wilson. Glad to be here with you. Some new faces and um, lots of faces of folks that I know and care so deeply about. So glad to be here with all of you. I am the new-ish uh, director of the Student Success Center and Strategic uh, Initiatives. Prior to my time in this role, I've been in the role about three months. Um, maybe four. Math isn't my strong suit. So um, prior to that, I was in basic education for adults, and I've been at the state board overall for about four um, years. And um, I am going to attempt to um, do justice to um, Lynn Palmentier Holder's work. And so I'll be presenting on both of our behalves uh, this this time around as she is um, working on the first meeting of um, her board that we'll talk a bit about soon. Um, so glad to be here with all of you. And Claudine, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, my name is Claudine Richardson, and I serve as the Policy Associate for Guided Pathways in our Student Success Center and Strategic Initiatives under Monica's leadership. And so it's a beautiful space to be in. Thank you for being here. I will not be facilitating today, but I am more than happy to support you in any way possible. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Yes, we will. Um, sometimes it's hard to um, feel like you're filling in for colleagues, uh, Monica. So we super appreciate you <laughs> sharing um, Lynn's information. And I know you and Lynn collaborated on that. Um, so that will be wonderful. Thank you. Let's move into a, our land acknowledgement. I will read uh, our land acknowledgement and our labor acknowledgement uh, to ground us. Um, and as I go through the acknowledgements, um, what I like to ask people to do is uh, to reflect on how they're making connections uh, to these, um, these topics and how they're building relationships uh, to, to the people who are highlighted and mentioned in, in these acknowledgements. Um, and so moving it from uh, kind of a theoretical or institutional um, statement to something personal. Uh, and uh, really reflecting on how you are contributing to building relationships with those around you. Uh, so I will read our land acknowledgement. 
the State Board for Community and Technical Colleges acknowledges that our community resides on the ancestral lands of the First Peoples. The Office of the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges is located in Olympia on the Coast Salish lands of the Nisqually, Cowlitz, and Squaxin peoples. We ask you to join us in celebrating the indigenous tribes of Washington by acknowledging their ancestral lands, their communities, and the past, present, and future generations of the Native peoples across our good state. And our labor acknowledgement. We also acknowledge that our nation and our institutions have benefited and profited from the free enslaved labor of Black people. We recognize the entangled and interconnected histories of Indigenous peoples who were forcibly removed from their land and the plight of the Black people who were forcibly brought to it. We acknowledge the enduring impacts of the African diaspora and lift up the contributions, talents, and dreams of Black communities. Importantly, we also acknowledge the immigrant and refugee labor that has contributed to the building of this country within our labor force, including voluntary, involuntary, trafficked, and undocumented peoples. We recognize and honor their important contributions to our good state and to this nation. Thank you. All right, our agenda, we will begin with an overview of uh, Senate Bill 5194, uh, including deadlines and submissions, and there are usually quite a few questions around those pieces, so I'll attempt to, uh, to share that information and, and attempt to answer your questions. Uh, and then we will um, move to intersections uh, with this work and tribal relations and guided pathways. So we like to highlight the uh, broader context for this, uh, the, the work that is specifically mentioned in 5194. It's uh, obviously the legislation is not created in a vacuum and there has already been a lot of really good work, foundational work done in different aspects um, uh, related to equity and related to anti-racism. And we wanna make those connections um, between the work. Uh, so that folks can see those explicitly if it's something that you're not already thinking about uh, in terms of strategic plans uh, and tribal relations and guided pathways. Uh, and then we have three colleges to highlight. Uh, so we like to provide some uh, examples. So if you're uh, at a college that maybe is still early in the process of developing your DEI strategic plan, um, then hearing from other colleges might help inform um, uh, your practice or your processes for developing those plans. So we will uh, hear from Whatcom and Walla Walla, and then I will share some of Everett's information. Um, since as I mentioned earlier, that team was unable to join us today. Um, I will attempt to do them justice. Uh, and then we'll take questions. Uh, as we go through, please feel free to, if you have questions, um, uh, pressing questions as people are presenting, please feel free to put those in the chat um, or raise your hand. Um, we should have time to take some questions as we go, but also uh, at the end, we'll leave, we'll leave time as well. Okay, anything else before I get started? I think I got everything. Okay, so just as a reminder, and probably uh, many of you, most of you are, are familiar with the legislation um, uh, for 5194, but the, the Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Strategic Plan is section three of this legislation. And uh, the legislature is uh, asking folks to consider these four pieces as they create DEI strategic plans for the college. Um, now the DEI strategic plan, some folks have asked, well, is that, is that different from the college's strategic plan? Does it look different from the institutional plan? And the answer is it depends on how your college has drafted its, its overall college strategic plan. Um, many colleges already embed equity and DEI strategies in their overall college plan. So in that case, you might have an embedded plan um, and that will suffice as your DEI strategic plan if that is the case. Some colleges uh, overall strategic plans do not embed equity uh, as explicitly uh, as, as they might want to. Uh, and so in that case, the colleges are creating a separate standalone DEI strategic plan to accompany their overall college plan. So it depends on what your structure looks like uh, and the work that's been done. Um, in any case, whether you are embedding your DEI strategic plan with your overall college plan or whether you're creating a standalone, uh, the legislature is asking that colleges consider these four pieces in developing their 
their strategic plan, their DEI strategic plan. And that is culturally appropriate student outreach programs. Um, so uh, making sure that colleges are establishing culturally appropriate student outreach to communities of color, students with disabilities and low income communities. Um, and that the programs should assist potential students to understand opportunities available uh, and to navigate student aid. Uh, also peer mentoring strategies, colleges must include opportunities for students from minoritized communities to form student-based organizations uh, to mentor and assist each other in navigating the educational system. A faculty diversity program uh, should be designed to provide for the retention and recruitment of faculty from all racial, ethnic, and cultural backgrounds um, and must be based on proven practices and diversity hiring processes. And then lastly, DEI definitions. Colleges must include DEI definitions in their strategic plans, reports, and public websites. Um, and that is to help folks establish a baseline and common knowledge or sorry, common um, um, why did I lose the word? Common vocabulary, common baseline uh, for folks to understand what, uh, what we mean when we're using certain terms and phrases. So these are the elements that should be included in uh, a DEI strategic plan. Of course, there are many more uh, strategies and uh, concepts that folks are including in their plans, which is fantastic. Um, but those are specifically called out by the legislature. Uh, and so uh, additionally, uh, just for some logistics, um, the DEI strategic plans um, must be created using an inclusive process that includes staff, faculty, students, administrators, and other stakeholders. And so for some colleges, the timing is a little challenging because uh, some colleges have been working on DEI strategic plans for a little while uh, and um, maybe developing, developing them in a process that's not as inclusive. And now the law is coming in and saying, if you're developing plans, you've got to include these, uh, your, your campus community and college community and different stakeholders. And so if, you're, if you have a plan that had, has not been informed by staff, faculty, students, administrators, and others, um, then you're gonna want to include folks in the process. Um, so for some colleges, that's, um, uh, that means kind of backing up a little bit and uh, creating a process to, to uh, allow those folks to inform and then moving forward. And so what that looks like can be different. We'll hear from colleges today uh, and how they've approached uh, making the process inclusive, but that is a critical piece of uh, the bill is that the process is informed by more than just uh, say administrators or more than just say faculty members, et cetera. Uh, so dates and deadlines, we got a lot of questions about dates. Um, beginning July 30th of this year, um, and then, oh, if you can back up. Um, Back up one. Thank you so much, Christina. Um, uh, beginning July 30th of this year and every two years hereafter, uh, the colleges will submit DEI strategic plans to the state board. Uh, and so we realize that July 30th date is coming right up. Um, the good news is you can uh, submit a progress report if you don't yet have a full uh, DEI strategic plan, uh, then a progress report will do. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, in a little bit. Uh, we are able, I say we, I mean the equity, diversity, and inclusion team at the state board, we are available to review draft DEI strategic plans before you submit them on behalf of your college. So if you uh, would like us to take a look just to see if you're on the right track, um, see if there's anything that um, maybe you ought to include, uh, please let us know. We're happy to review uh, and give feedback. Uh, the colleges received an initial allocation of $125,000 for the fiscal year 21-22, uh, uh, and funds that are received must be used in that year. Uh, there's one exception for this first time allocation, however, uh, and a rollover of those funds will be available for use for the fiscal year 22-23, uh, just because this is the first time funding has been allocated and the timing was a little bit uh, a little bit off. Uh, and so uh, the legislature recognized that and said, all right, well, if you have um, any funding left over from the 21-22, go ahead and use it for 22-23. In the future though, the, the funds that are allocated within that for that 
fiscal year must be used in that fiscal year. Um, and subsequent allocations will be dispersed every year in the amount of 62,500 uh, without those rollovers. Um, so some of the questions we received about funding is, well, who, who in my college received this funding? I'm not aware that we, that we had any uh, allocated to us. And the answer uh, is different depending on your college. Um, and so, um, uh, you might be in a position where you're wanting to track down where that funding went uh, and how it's been dispersed on your particular campus. Um, so that might require some digging, unfortunately, for some folks. Uh, and then others know exactly where that funding um, has been allocated on their colleges. If we can be of any uh, help to you in um, helping to, to um, answer questions about funding, please reach out. Uh, to our team, to me or Ha or Christina, uh, and we can help you um, uh, figure out some answers to funding questions. Okay, next slide. So our submission process, as I mentioned, beginning uh, July 30th, and it's, I know it's coming up so fast, uh, you'll, you'll blink your eyes and it will be July 30th. Um, but again, you can turn in a progress report for your DEI strategic plan, which is just a way to indicate to the state board, hey, here's where we are in the process. We've done this, this, and this, and we have plans to do this, this, and this um, in the next however many weeks or months. Uh, so don't panic. If you can submit a progress report, that's great. If you have a final plan for submission, that's fantastic as well. Uh, we uh, drafted a template for a progress report uh, just so folks have some guidelines or something to work off of. So if you're not quite sure about what a progress report could look like for the DEI strategic plan, um, feel free to access that template. And Christina just put a link to the template in the chat box. Um, and that way you can see kind of the, the big, the basic chunks uh, that we're looking for uh, in terms of progress. Uh, so hopefully that is helpful to you. As always, if you have questions, please reach out to us. Um, these uh, progress reports or the final plans will be submitted to our equity, diversity and inclusion team at the state board. So we will receive them. And we will also send reminders to colleges uh, similar to reminders you might have received for the campus climate assessments, uh, we won't let critical dates pass without you being aware, so we will, we will nudge you. Um, and we are asking that uh, submission of the DEI plans or the progress reports come from the college presidents or someone that they designate. Uh, so a common question we get is who's submitting these plans to you or who's submitting this progress report to you? Um, and we would prefer that college presidents or someone they designate uh, submit to our uh, team at this email address on the screen. Again, you will receive reminders about this and we can clarify uh, if need be. Uh, and then here after colleges will submit DEI strategic plans by NLE. Um, so every two years. Um, and so I do wanna pause here and see if there are any questions about uh, deadlines, progress reports, plans. Any questions about processes? It's a very quick overview. Okay. All right, that might be a sign I'm explaining things well. I, I'll take it, I hope so. But I'll, of course, if you need clarification, uh, please reach out. Okay, so uh, the template that uh, we created, um, again, just to capture the largest pieces of what ought to be included in the DEI strategic plan, um, uh, focuses on the outreach program, the peer mentoring strategies, the faculty diversity program, and the DEI definitions. And so, if you open that uh, the template with the link that is in the chat, you'll see uh, there is space for addressing each of these goals and then also the objectives and the metrics for measuring each of these goals. Uh, and so if that is, uh, as long as that form is complete, uh, then that will be your progress report and you could submit that in lieu of a finalized strategic plan. All right, next slide. So with that, I will turn it over to Monica 
uh, who's going to highlight for us the connections between DEI strategic plans and the work that colleges are doing around those plans um, and also connecting to the importance of tribal relations. So Monica, it's all you. Thank you. Um, I have been sick. So I my lungs are feeling a little bit on fire today and I've got a cough drop. So if I need to mute, <laughs> that's why. Um, all right, so again, I'm Monica Wilson and I'm here representing for um, the Student Success Center as well as um, Lynn Palmentier Holder, who is the Tribal Relations Director. Um, Claudine is also here and will support. Um, thank you, Claudine. Uh, we can move forward to the next slide. So um, I'm I'm going to start a little bit with um, with the tribal relations piece um, again, which is not necessarily my work, but something that um, we're working closely with Lynn on because we recognize the importance of this work um, as the foundation for for so much of what we are doing and what we should be doing. I guess I'm thinking about this um, aspirationally. Um, so thinking about um, why intersect guided pathways and tribal relations, um, the first peoples of Washington state have to be identified and centered um, as historically minoritized and more marginalized populations. And, um, you know, when we think about the histories of First Peoples in Washington and relationships with education, boarding schools. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of reasons why the, the current state looks the way it does. And so there's a lot of work to, um, to build trust and to build relationship. And so this is really um, how Lynn comes into this, to this space um, in helping us to build build those relationships. We know that when we look at data, it's hard to look at. Um, we see how American Indians and Alaska Native populations are highly underrepresented and they have some of the highest, um, this says dropout, I'm gonna say push out rates in our system. Um, and those disparities exist no matter how you slice and dice it. So, we, um, we have a lot of work to do, um, especially given the realities of the pandemic and the disproportionate impact that the pandemic has had on American Indians and Alaska Native populations. Can we move forward to the next slide? So, in, we're, and we're still in a space of developing a collaborative strategy. I wanna be really clear about that. I'm very new to my role. Lynn is somewhat new to her role. Um, but thinking about how we, um, how we are supporting Alaska, American Indian and Alaska Native students um, with recruitment, retention, completion, um, and we know that so much of that has to do with our relationships. So the SBC, Lynn is not here today because she is um, preparing for the um, Washington CTC American Indian Indigenous Advisory Board, um, which will, um, the acronym is WACAB, which I'm not sure which is more of a mouthful, but um, that group is really looking to guide the development of government to government relationships between the CTCs and Washington tribes. And this is a big piece of, of this. Um, and that they are looking to develop a training toolkit complete with policies, practices, cultural protocols, and resources for the colleges to use, um, while also creating opportunities for relationship building, because the best toolkit doesn't do anything without a meaningful relationship with it, um, preceding it. <laughs> um, and so we are looking to also um, hire Indigenous scholars and promote tribal student pathways and curriculum reviews to incorporate Indigenous knowledge systems as well, right? Because we know that it, it has to be bigger than, um, than just a plan. 
um, or a toolkit, but how are we making sure, what does belonging look like in this space? I guess is ultimately the, the big question for me. If you don't have culturally responsive curriculum, if you don't have a space where students feel like they're welcome. And so having support for the colleges to understand what that can look like. Next slide, please. And here we have some data. Um, and this is data that has been pulled from SBCTC. Um, and I, I think that this data for me um, creates a lot more questions then it provides answers. But this just shows kind of the student diversity um, broken down fall um, quarters over the last several years. And the red in indicates a dip in enrollment. And so where a mass American Indian Alaska Native is listed, we see that there are ongoing um, declines. And that I mean, that's that's a bit of information, but that certainly doesn't tell us a lot. So I want to be really aware of that. Um, and so um, offering this data as a as a place and you have the slides, but to think, what does this mean? Um, and what which what, what questions should we be asking about this? Um, next slide. And the same is true here with full time faculty. Um, you see a little bit of an increase on the top line as we're talking about American Indian and Alaska Native um, faculty, full-time, part-time faculty. And one of the things that Lynn has talked about is all of the Native um, education programs that are happening at the four-year colleges that may have an impact on um, the pipeline. Right? Um, and that may be a dip here or the, the increase that we see. But again, there's lots of questions that we can ask about this information. Like, um, you know, what, what does this mean for full, like, what, is a, what is a further breakdown by part-time, full-time or tenured faculty or who's being paid um, out of soft dollars instead of state dollars, right? There's a lot, a lot that we can ask and those questions are just a few. So I am, I didn't want to present this without asking some of those questions because um, I think that just showing showing the information could just be problematic. Um, so want to want to name that, but recognizing that this is a part of our work in increasing um, full, especially full time faculty roles um, from American Indian and Alaska Native faculty and scholars, as well as um, thinking about how we are recruiting and orienting students coming in. Next slide, please. Um, and this is, I think that we've seen this map in different ways. Sometimes we see this in terms of land acknowledgements and showing, um, sometimes we talk about it as traditional lands of different people. And I, one of the pieces of conversations that I've really appreciated with Lynn is that um, these red spots are um, tiny <laughs> in comparison to what they actually are when we're talking about traditional lands, these are reservation lands. And when we think about the actual lands of where people are from and how um, American Indians have been grouped together, uh, Colville Tribe is a really good example, any kind of confederated tribal group, um, we, we miss a lot of information, right? We miss a lot of larger context. And when we think about this whole map being read, I think that that is, um, for me anyway, is a better way to think about how the, the importance of building these relationships and these formal government to government um, relationships and agreements between the, the tribes and, um, and the work that's being done. I see in the chat, there's not a link to WAPHAB yet. The first meeting is tomorrow where they'll be developing charter and, um, and more. So I would imagine that at the next session, Lynn will have an update for, um, for you all. So um, 
thinking about our responsibility in building these government-to-government uh, -government relationships here. And if we can move to the next slide, which kind of shows some of the, um, the overall work. So, you know, we have um, on the slide before we have the, the reservations. And then here, where this is, this is looking at the overall map, the Washington State K-12 school districts. And there's so much going on here when we think about the, um, the educational service districts, the public school districts, the tribal education compact schools, where our community colleges um, fit into all of this. And then the, the uh, public four-year colleges here. Um, and if we were to have a robust system of relationship building, um, government to government agreements, and everyone kind of coming together to think about what this pipeline looks like, right? I think about that as part of my role and part of the role of the Student Success Center in, um, in Guided Pathways is how can we help how can we help convene and think about that whole um, pipeline and pathway for students from the time they start in early learning till the time they are in a career and beyond. And so that means, again, building these relationships and thinking about the big picture. Um, can we go to the next slide? And Washington, or at least our community and technical college system, this is a space where we are very much in development. So WACAB is kind of this, the dotted line there is showing that it's still being developed. Um, whereas, you know, K-12 has, um, have these agreements and relationships, early learning um, also have relationships, the four-year colleges. So we're a little late to the party, but you know, we're, we, we're here. <laughs> so um, the, recognizing just the importance of this and, and where we're at here and the work that we still have to do. And then um, the next slide, please. So this is Lynn's information. Um, and encourage you to reach out to Lynn with questions about WACAB or other pieces of, of um, her work and the work of WACAB and, um, and and I'm thinking about other things that are kind of in the works that I'm like, oh, do I say something or not say something? I'm not going to say something. It's not my place. So reach out to Lynn with questions and then um, if we can go to the next slide. So, <coughs> excuse me. In the Student Success Center, these are kind of like four bucket areas that we really think about. So the first is Guided Pathways Implementation. And when we think about Guided Pathways, um, there's a set of essential practices that are aligned with Guided Pathways. And we often thought about Guided Pathways as, um, well, what we're doing right now is we're, we're thinking about how we best use Guided Pathways as a tool to achieve our racial equity goals and to be in harmony with our statewide vision and mission and values. And that's a lot of work because Guided Pathways wasn't necessarily developed um, specifically to address racial equity. So there's some, there's some work that has to be done there. And um, one of the pieces here for Guided Pathways that we, um, that we focus on uh, one is legislation. So we have some uh, some dollars that you may be aware of that came along with guided pathways implementation from the legislature, and that really asked the colleges to look at essential and emerging practices to meet universal and targeted completion goals. Um, through pathway mapping, dedicated advising and career counseling, um, really looking at closing opportunity gaps and then also anti-racist curriculum and teaching practices, just to name a few. Um, with that, we also think about the integration of technology. There's a, a management system, some of you might heard of, of CTC Link. And so thinking about how we are doing a good job of integrating between guided pathways and the tools in CTC Link and 
also identifying the work that still needs to be done and making sure that everyone um, has access to those tools and that they're working for them. We do a lot of work around peer and professional learning, and um, this is a place that clouding really shines. Uh, having um, planned and implemented retreats and institutes across the state. Um, and we have a lot still coming up. We've been reading work plans um, and we'll continue to read work plans to really help finalize what our learning agenda will look like for the next year. Um, and then our other, uh, other place that I think is most important to me is collaboration and community because I know that nothing can happen um, with student success if we aren't breaking down silos and barriers and working closely together. And so uh, one of the places that I feel like we've had the most success so far in my very brief tenure is in a relationship building with Lynn Palmentier Holder and the continued work that we will do um, that we will do there. Um, and with the EDI team thinking about this, it, this is what it looks like at the agency. We know that many um, the colleges experience the same sort of silos, but on a much larger scale. So thinking about this work both internally and externally, and then engaging in various strategic initiatives that really hold up student success. Um, next slide, please. And so back to thinking about planning. And this is um, one of the, the last slides I have here, and then I, I will quit talking. But um, you know, you're here to talk about your equity plan. Um, and I think about the strategic, or excuse me, the work plans that we just received from all 34 colleges with lots of really important reflective questions and questions about data and planning questions. And recognizing that those have been somewhat disconnected from the larger planning that's happening on campuses. And so one of my questions is what would a work plan look like that is aligned with the other things that colleges are already doing? like your equity plan, your EDI strategic plan. And so what I have suggested and what we're doing, I guess, <laughs> this is still new, like, oh, we're gonna just do this thing um, as a, from a director role, um, is that we're going to not have a fresh work plan next year. We're going to turn the work plan that was just submitted into a two-year work plan. And we're gonna gather information from lots of other places because we have the information to gather. We have lots of alternative um, places that we can gather data. So um, we have an annual report that the colleges do for guided pathway funding. Um, all colleges do a comprehensive local needs assessment for Perkins dollars. This summer, there will be a scale of adoption survey um, we have coaches that work with the colleges that give reports and, and feedback. Um, we also have so much data coming out of event evaluations. Colleges submit institutional grants and reports. We want to use all of that information really wisely and also create conditions where moving forward, there is alignment. So if you want to move to the next slide, so moving the 22-23 plan into a 22-24 plan also kind of aligns with the timeline for your EDI plans. So what we are looking for in terms of the work plans of the future um, is alignment and integration with those other plans. And um, when I, I have evidence based here, because um, that sounded fancy, but really I'm thinking about a show and tell. <laughs> and I do know what evidence based means, uh, but I'm thinking about what is your evidence that you're doing guided pathways and that guided pathways work and planning is aligned elsewhere? How can you point to, and I think that Melissa did a nice job talking about this, with the equity plans, you already have this somewhere, right? Show us. Right? If you already have guided pathways aligned here um, with your equity plan, with your strategic enrollment plan, with your overall strategic plan, show us. Um, we want to see the work that you're already doing and use that um, as, as a checkpoint for planning versus asking you to do something brand new so that that energy 
can be put into those important places, right? Um, in, in really furthering equity and doing the work, of the, the work that Lynn is leading and beyond. We want to make sure that the planning um, is really action oriented and that it's useful. So when you're thinking about what do we do next or where do we need to, need to dig deeper, you have a resource that helps guide you in that direction. Um, and that underneath it all, it is equity focused. We know that our success is measured by the success of our students, right? Our success as a system office is measured by the success of, of the system. And um, having come from a college and, and worked at the state board for a few years, I understand the administrative burden that can come with a lot of different plans. And so really wanting to reduce some of that and, and build on what you're already doing and highlight that work. So that is really kind of our, our plan moving forward. Um, and more to come on some of the exciting pieces around what um, guided pathways and tribal relations, that relationship looks like. I think that's my last slide. Um, but there might be one more. Let's see, can we move to the next one? We're moving on to the cultures next. Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. So we are we are done um, with that. Any questions or Claudine? I know I've been going on and on. Anything to, to add or other questions? No, I think you um, highlighted the fact that um, in this process, historically for whether it's guided pathways edi or the culture that is our campus that it takes the persons like you here present today all of you um, to essentially show up in a way that is courageous and necessary um, to support this work moving forward and oftentimes that includes some overarching recognition of which voices have been laden um, in the process and then also the tension the static that comes between struggling to ensure that those voices are heard as well as what is crafted and inked on paper and we recognize that when you develop a strategic strategic plan in alignment what, with really what is your institutional mission fulfillment, <laughs> that, that static does come up. And so um, just know that you are incredibly supported and encouraged um, by the SBCTC EDI office and by multiple members across SBCTC in that process. And so thank you for your courage and your necessary work moving forward. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Monica, and Claudine for putting that so eloquently and drawing those connections. And um, for some folks, especially with the tribal relations connection, that can be a big reframe because we haven't, we have not uh, done our due diligence as a system and, and often as individuals as well um, to, to make that deliberate, purposeful, explicit uh, connection and to really forefront that work. Uh, so that's going to be different for a lot of folks, especially for colleges that um, don't already have strong connections with tribes. For those that do, they're probably already on it and thinking about it often, uh, but for others, not so much. And so that explicit connection, I think, is a little bit different for people to hear about sometimes, but so, so critical. Um, so really appreciate you um, sharing on Lynn's behalf. And then of course, uh, with Guided Pathways, I really, I want to reiterate because I really um, appreciate you pointing out, Monica, um, leverage the work you've been doing, you know, leverage the work that you've been doing. You don't have to start from scratch. There's been so much, um, so much intensive labor over the past few years uh, with Guided Pathways and equity plans and, um, uh, you know, people have been putting in so much and continue, you know, continue to use that and leverage that. Uh, so alignment and leveraging and getting critical mass for your, your EDI strategic plans uh, or your DEI strategic plans are going to be really, it's going to be really important. Um, so thank you. Yes. Uh, any questions or thoughts before we move on to the college highlights or the the college showcases. I just want to make sure I'm giving space for that. Okay. 
Okay, so we will move along uh, and Whatcom Community College is up first. So I will turn it over to Terry. Thank you, Melissa, appreciate it. Um, it's great to be here today. Uh, we're gonna kind of briefly go over Whatcom's um, our strategic plan, which we've incorporated the equity components, and that was done in 2017 and 22. Uh, but one of the projects that we'll be working on this next year is, is kind of the bigger piece of why I'm here. Um, so I can go ahead and go to the next slide. And Christina, can I click into the plan or can you pull up the plan for me? Sure, one moment. No problem. So one of the great things about the strategic plan that we have at Welcome Community College is it really is integrated. That's one thing that I have really appreciated in the work is keeping that equity piece a part of the overall goal. Um, it should be intertwined together and woven. The work isn't separate. It really is about um, what we're doing as a whole with the work. Um, and so if we go down to um, our core theme goal three is kind of where our equity components live. This is where we're kind of building off of this foundation. Um, and it's in it's advancing equity. And if you go ahead and scroll down a little bit farther. There we go. So each one of these are kind of that those goals that we have on our campus, the things that we look for, it's already integrated in a lot of the things that we do. Our faculty, when they submit requests to do uh, faculty education workshops that we ask, you know, what aspects of the advancing equity core theme is being highlighted. Oftentimes when we ask or individuals are asking for professional development, again, what is it that is highlighted or what is the goal that's being addressed in this? Even for space planning, when there's a request for space for different activities, programs, or um, faculty space, again, we're asking, how does it fit within the core theme of advancing equity? And so we'll, this is what we'll be submitting and working on the foundation for this moving forward um, as we continue to develop and looking at, again, institutional demographic data, as well as the data collected from our climate survey and listening and feedback sessions that will help us in really assessing how we're doing. And I'm hoping that this continues to push us to ask questions differently and engage with our community on and off campus differently. I think that's one of the things that we're hearing um, on our campus, but also other institutions is, what does that look like for the community as a whole off campus? How are we engaging? We know that our numbers are low. Uh, we just saw those statistics for Native students. Um, it's hard to survey people when they're not here. And so how are we accessing them to get that data? And I think that's always a, a struggle when we look at um, racial demographics and, and those kind of aspects and collecting that information. So moving forward this work, it's kind of exciting. I know we've got some expectations that we have that have been set before us from the state, but as we go through and we interpret this, work and the expectations allows for a lot of different ideas and creativity to come in and how as institutions plan on making this work happen on their campus. Um, and this is kind of where I wanted to highlight one of the things that Wacom is working on. Um, Christine, we'll go ahead to the next slide. And so as I've been having conversations um, with our um, cabinet, with community members, we are and we'll be incorporating an indigenous strategic plan in our strategic plan um, for next year. And this work started with a task force that was created about three years ago. And there was an inquiry about putting native language on our buildings um, that really pushed us to review policy, ask some questions and speak some truths. And this work will take time, but there are some pieces that we are looking at as media action that we can take as we continue to build these relationships with our tribal communities. Um, Lummi Nation and Nooksack uh, tribe are close to us, but for many of us as native individuals, we know that um, we are everywhere. We're not necessarily on our tribal lands for various reasons. Uh, we've been pushed out, moved around um, and finding home in other places and other communities. 
And so when we think about what this looks like, there is the, um, the work we're doing with our local tribes nearby, but also just our native individuals and voices that are on campus from other nations across the United States. Um, so this work will take some time as we build those relationships and create a plan that includes indigenous voices, both internal and external. And while we're doing the work of long-term change, there are the media actions that we're looking at and that I've kind of highlighted. We'll be creating a Whatcom land acknowledgement. Um, this one is one that is a little bit near and dear to my heart. Uh, land acknowledgements can be very difficult. Again, as we understand the purpose and intention behind them and that's action. Uh, there should always be action behind a land acknowledgement as to what we're doing to elevate native voices to bring that um, perspective uh, to our communities. Um, it requires conversation and understanding how does each nation uh, feel about land acknowledgements? How do individuals feel? Um, and then how do we put as an institution action behind our statement that we have that represents our institution? I think the other thing that's important to know is that, again, this is the, this is that understanding of government to government relations. This is our commitment um, in, in respecting the fact that there that are federally recognized tribes. And I want to, I want to really be specific about that because that's an important aspect to um, our sovereign nations and deserve to be acknowledged as such. Um, We'll also be looking at implementing internal protocols when it comes to working with sovereign nations. We struggle as a campus to fully understand sovereignty and respecting government to government relations. And as a campus community, we need to understand what it means to invite an indigenous person to campus um, or to participate in an experience. And this has been really great work. I have had some amazing conversations that add clarity to that, uh, understanding of what it means to be sovereign. Um, and it's interesting how these pop up. And, and a, an example that I have, which seems simple, but again, is, is complex at the same time is, you know, I was contacted by a faculty member um, who wanted to invite a native woman to speak in her class. And they were asking about honorariums, like, how does that work? What do we do? And one of the things, again, as we work with indigenous peoples and we understand who they are. My question was, are you asking the individual to come as a professional based on their academic experiences or cultural knowledge? And we kind of dived into the conversation because as a native woman, as a professional, um, having you know, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, um, there are different ways in which we honor people and how they come to spaces. And so my questions were, you know, why this, why this person? Um, are you asking them to represent an indigenous nation? Um, are you asking them as an academic or professional? And can we compensate them in the way that we would another academic and professional individual? And these, again, just come to great considerations of the complex intersectionality of identity, as well as honoring um, ind indigeneity. And I think that, you know, again, we are, we are people, we are here, we are present as Native individuals, and it's not as simple as we might think it is just to um, invite someone to a class to represent and being able to understand what that means. Um, we'll include community collaborations. So we have done quite a few things. Um, within our bigger, a bigger community. We collaborated with the Whatcom Museum for an MMIWP event. Um, and we're looking at this also beyond indigenous, um, voice, uh, indigenous aspects, but with other communities. How are we engaging Whatcom County as a whole in the equity work that we're doing as an institution? Um, and this is just one example. Uh, indigenous art on campus, what does that mean? Uh, where does it stand? What is the representation? And how, again, do Indigenous voices get to be at that table and that consideration? We often think and put Indigenous individuals in the past and the history. We still do. Uh, you know, pictures are found in libraries. 
Um, and how do we change that and shift that to be in present spaces uh, where individuals can be seen where they're at um, here and now? We are still looking at native languages on buildings and how does that, what does that mean? How does that work? And how do we do that in the way that best represents um, native peoples? And I believe it makes us think again about the truths of the impact of colonization. Um, it leads to an understanding of intention and impact and it leads to, to truth um, in what it means to reconcile Again, not just with indigenous people, but with all of those that that have have been harmed. Um, there's a statement on here: um, education is the key to reconciliation. We must own the truth that as a system, we have educated and trained the policymakers and administrators of government, industry, and education of the past and present. These are leaders who created harm, isolation, and the destruction of cultures and of people. With this truth comes the acknowledgement that education created change for upcoming generations and future leaders that will lead us through healing and reconciliation. And I think that's the power of this work. When we really pay attention to what we're doing and acknowledging the truth, that's hard to do. It is painful. Um, it's, it's hard to own our place in that and what that means. Um, and this work really kind of asks us to do that because we can't actually change what's happening now until we own that truth. And I don't know if many of you are aware, but there's a lot happening around understanding, investigation and healing around um, boarding schools, um, reports and, and data that's being collected. And we see these low numbers for indigenous people in higher ed. And I think that the truth is um, there's been so much harm in education in the past and still in the present that keeps those numbers low. And in order for us to increase those numbers, it really takes an institution and a system to own that truth, um, to bring and center in those voices that have been impacted in such a way that they are not a part of the community. Um, it's difficult to be in, in this space in higher ed uh, to work within a system that caused so much harm. Uh, and yet at the same time, we have to, because in order to break the system down, we have to be aware of what has taken place. So this, this work, I believe, you know, with Guided Pathways, with Lynn and all of the stuff that's happening and building these relationships has a great deal of power in how we move forward in all of our equity work, um, not just indigenous voices, but all of it. And I think that this allows us to um, come to a different place and understanding of who we are as a system. And I'm looking forward to what the potential of that is in the work that we're doing, not just at Whatcom, but throughout Washington. Thank you so much, Terry. Uh, and I, I'm writing down notes as people are talking, uh, just to reiterate some of the beautiful things that folks are sharing. And, um, you know, the uh, I appreciate your sharing those specific actions uh, for Whatcom's uh, Indigenous Strategic Plan. And I think that's so often where you mentioned creativity and, and the opportunity that the legislation creates for creativity, which is so true. Um, but often we can get stuck and we get stuck often on those actions. And just like you referenced with land acknowledgements, uh, you know, what's the action piece of that? And same thing with strategic plans. You know, you wanna have those specific initiatives. You wanna have those specific actions that you're taking that, that are going to contribute to that. Uh, plan, of course. And so uh, it's helpful, I think, for folks to see the very specific things that um, the, uh, um, Whatcom's been doing. Uh, so thank you for that. And also uh, to highlight that importance of his historic legacy, um, because it's absolutely true, we are not going to be able to understand or address 
uh, the equity uh, issues that we face, that our students face, uh, if we remain ignorant of, of those historical legacies for higher ed, for uh, the community and technical colleges, um, uh, for curricula, all of those pieces. Um, so being very truthful in what um, students have experienced uh, over the decades, over the centuries, uh, and um, being very truthful about how our systems continue to perpetuate that inequity is critical. So I really appreciate those pieces. Uh, I wanna open for questions, thoughts, ideas um, for Terry. I, I wrote down almost word for word. I don't know if I caught it quite completely, but um, I appreciate that you mentioned the work that we're all doing is, uh, is how we have power in equity work, it's, you know, and, and it's so true, our collaborations um, and all of the pieces that we're doing uh, are so incredibly powerful when we put them together. So I appreciate it. Thank you, Terry. And again, uh, Terry's information is included uh, at the end of the slide deck that you all have access to. So if there's anything to follow up on, uh, please feel free to reach out to her. Okay, we will move to our next college highlight uh, from Walla Walla. So Margarita and Nick, if you're ready, you can hop right in. Thanks, Melissa. And thank you, Terry, for sharing um, your words and that space. I really appreciate hearing what others are doing. Um, my name is Margarita Banderas. I am the Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at Walla Walla Community College. Um, before I get started, Nick, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Nick Veluzzi. I'm uh, Vice President of Enrollment Services and Institutional Effectiveness here at Walla Walla Community College. I used to be here. Thanks. And if we could go to the next slide, yeah. and we can skip to the next one. Thanks, Christina. Um, so I'm going to just start with a little bit of the framework. Uh, we did our strategic planning process last year, so during 2020, 2021. Um, and for, for the framework of that, we had had two separate strategic plans before, um, the college-wide and then the EDI strategic plan were separate, and they both expired in 2020. Um, as you know, we were going through the pandemic and looking at what made the most sense for, for, for our strategic planning process, we decided to do a shorter strategic plan at the time. Uh, we worked with a consultant, uh, Dr. Bob Hughes, um, in looking at uh, how we were gonna uh, realign our resources, uh, assessing student needs in that time with the pandemic and the college was going through some leadership changes. Um, the biggest piece, knowing that we came from a structure of having two strategic plans, uh, was that we wanted to make sure that the equity piece, the equity focus was uh, the leading uh, voice in our strategic plan. We wanted that embedded throughout rather than side carrying the, the, the equity the strategic plan. So that was a key, key element as we launched this process. Um, the strategic planning had three phases. We started with a data review and discussion, making sure that uh, the process was inclusive, that we brought in um, different constituents and heard their opinions. Uh, then we had the second phase of actually drafting and developing the strategic goals and objectives that promoted equity. And then the third phase uh, was how do we put those strategic goals and objectives into action through an equity lens. Uh, so with that framework, I'll pass it on to Nick to start with our phase one. Thanks, Margarita. Um, so in reviewing phase one, it, it, it was really kind of um, similar to your a standard institutional planning process that many of you have probably um, gone through at your own institutions. Um, but as, as Margarita indicated we, we were going through this process as you know we were full-blown pandemic mode everybody's working from home and we we're trying to do engagement um in this kind of a format and i think you know we were all really kind of just figuring it out and um 
and and when I'm <laughs> when I was looking at this presentation coming into today, I, I was you know going back in my mind to this moment and um you know trying to do some kind of medium and long term planning in an environment that is um, just by a definition inherently unstable was really a challenge. And um, so, we, you know, we did the best we could in certain in terms of the um, uh, environmental scanning process, you know, um, collecting a lot of socioeconomic data on our service district composition of, of um, our students and, and faculty and staff at the college, um, evaluating um, needs assessments and, and things along those lines. Uh, uh, we, we attempted a, uh, a community survey and, and, you know, I was involved in our prior institutional planning process and also had a leadership role in, in the um, initial diversity, equity, and inclusion plan at Walla Walla Community College. And those two processes were really involved in, uh, really involved community members and, and key stakeholders. And that was something that was very, very hard to do at this time around. Um, so I wanted to um, make sure I mentioned that. And, um, you know, the other thing is, as I go through these, um, the common themes that were expressed by um, those who participated, you know, it really reflected this kind of sort of moment in time in our context. And as Margarita indicated, um, you know, Walla Walla Community College was going through some pretty significant leadership change. We had some pretty serious um, financial issues that we were also just coming out of and trying to um, recover from at the same time. And, um, and then you layer, layer a pandemic on top of that. And so we, we felt a lot of urgency around um, the need to both integrate um, inclusion and equity and strategic, strategic action together. And um, even if it wasn't for this, what we would sort of standardly go for like a five year um, time period or align it with accreditation or anything like that, that like that, we felt like um, we needed something. We needed some kind of rudder along with a sail that would um, allow us to work together and, and set a course and, and everybody grab a paddle and, and get moving in the same direction. And so the things that, that came up uh, most commonly um, were around affordability and, and cost of attendance. Um, and, and here, as I indicated before, there are some financial issues. So um, um, financial stability rose to the top. And enrollment management, I think all of us collectively have been experiencing some um, enrollment decline over the last decade or so. And then that really compounded and exacerbated um, between the sort of spring of 2020 and the fall of 2020. Um, I think um, as a system, we're down about 25% um, from that 1920 year to the present. And, you know, obviously all colleges are experiencing that a little bit differently, but, but all in all, we have got a pretty significant enrollment issue and that has a pretty significant impact on all of our institutions um, locally in terms of tuition revenue. Um, so that was another element that came to the, that rose to the top. And then, um, you know, two other things that were, were important and that seemed to me to, to um, surface in these processes, and that is, um, at least in our context, is to um, ensure we're promoting our workforce programs and trades programs sufficiently. And I, and I think the emphasis here on promotion is a reflection, again, of that moment in time, because there were a couple of program eliminations that occurred. Um, as a result of the um, uh, financial issues, and um, also ensure that our, our offerings, our, our program mix is relevant and serves the needs of, of the community. Now, all that information was, was framed, the, the integration of, of equity, um, you can see there on the, the left lo lower left of the screen, is really to focus on it continuously ask, ask ourselves, you know, who are we not serving 
and um, who are we not serving well? And so that really asked us to kind of dig in to look at um, um, equity gaps and, and, and questions around retention and completion. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. So after we went through that phase of, of the, the research and um, uh, community engagement, we, um, we moved into the development of goals and objectives. And so our process there was really focused on um, leveraging our governance council and the executive leadership team had a lot of interaction back and forth to digest that information and um, establish some goals. Um, along with some objectives, and, and our and, and our um, intention here was to really kind of keep it simple. Um, we we incorporated the community feedback that we collected, um, and then we brought that plan to the board of trustees. Boy, Margarita, was that about a year ago? So we, we did this about a year ago, and um, if we want to go to the next. Um, slide, I can start, I'll, I'll do a quick review of the goals. So the first goal is, is really focused on instruction and quality of instruction and, and learning pathways that meets the need of, needs of students and, and communities. And I'll, I'll, I'll refrain from um, reading the slides verbatim for you. you. I'm sure you're all doing that as I speak and, and I think these slides will be available anyway. Um, but really what we wanna be emphasizing here is, um, I'll, I'll draw attention to objective one, and, and that is really being um, um, inclusive and establishing a sense of belonging and ensuring our campus is equitable um, to, to all students and across instructional modalities. And so I think um, you know we also all have experienced this over the last 18 months or so, and that is that that shift to um, um, online learning and really it's sort of the online environment eclipsing the face-to-face -face environment in many cases. And with that, we, uh, at least in our situation, we've noticed a significant um, shift in student achievement. So that's something that we're really looking at. Um, and then focusing on those hallmarks of, of student success around, um, you know, opportunity access, retention, completion, um, the, the movement into four-year institutions and then into the um, labor market. And then, um, and then the third objective there is, is something I kind of touched on already and is that that's ensuring that our program mix as a, as a relatively small rural comprehensive college, we wanna make sure that our program mix is such that we're serving the needs of the, the community and the students that we're serving. Okay, next slide. The, the second goal that rose to um, the surface, which um, wasn't terribly surprising, was around fiscal sustainability and um, taking measures to ensure um, um, long-term sustainable um, financial health of the college. And um, so there's a few things that are combined there. One is uh, really emphasizing um, recruitment and outreach and thinking about how we do that, um, getting more resources into, into those areas of the college. I think, um, you know, historically, um, our institution and many like ours hadn't had to do much work around that. And, and we are, um, finding ourselves to be um, needing to be far more intentional um, in our recruitment work. And we started along that path um, prior to the pandemic. For instance, we got some local funds um, from a grant maker to do some um, what I would call a culturally appropriate um, recruitment and, and establish what we refer to as the American Dream Academy that was specifically designed to do outreach to um, Hispanic Latinx families in, in the region um, and offer um, kind of like college access workshops um, in, in Spanish that included, you know, childcare and things like that, and, and typically a meal. Um, 
And then the, the second objective there is really around having a, a um, transparent and inclusive um, budget planning process. And we're still, we're still working toward that. And um, the third piece there is, um, you know, ensuring that the, the resources that we're developing and, and allocating are supporting the um, one, the, the strategic direction and goal of, of the college, and also we're sort of, you know, I like to say kind of working smart and we're um, doing our best to be efficient and attempting to um, uh, generate revenue while, while doing that, while serving the communities. Okay, uh, third one, yeah, thank you. Our third goal is, is focused mostly there on, on inclusion and, and a sense of belonging. We, we, um, I, I had been doing some focus groups just uh, um, last week and, um, and um, in that experience, the um, questions around a sense of belonging like rose to the surface. It was like a through line through four different um, focus groups that we did and there were four different populations. So it was, it was very interesting to me in that sense. Um, but that's what we were focused on here. And it's kind of divided up into um, two areas, one um, focusing on our internal college communities and our external communities. And um, the first two are, are more, more internal, and that is around um, um, ensuring that we have an inclusive, working toward an inclusive environment where um, everyone who's coming through the doors is feeling like they belong here, like this is a safe place, like they wanna be here. And um, the, the second objective is around um, uh, the relationship between inclusiveness and decision-making and specifically focused on, on participatory governance. Third and, and fourth pieces there, um, we, I guess you, I can't see the fourth. I don't know if you can, but it might be a, just the way my screen is set up because I've got everybody across the top of my screen. So that might be what's cutting off the bottom margin, but I have it on another screen here because I'm working in um, what I call Trario these days with three screens. Um, so um, the third objective is uh, really working with our community partners and, and focusing on program development and increasing opportunity for our students and the communities we serve, focusing on educational attainment and also the economic um, vitality of, of our service area. And that there is that link between access, opportunity, equity outcomes and closing achievement gaps and um, that link between the individual attainment and the benefits that it brings back to place. And the, the fourth and final objective is really to um, um, make clear and intentional the college's role in the community and to be involved in, um, in our, the communities that we serve across the district and, um, and play a significant role in, in shaping the development trajectory of our communities. Thanks, Nick. Does this come back to you, Margarita? Yes. <laughs> so then the third phase of the strategic planning was uh, how do we put this into action? We develop this goal and objectives that align with the, with, with the needs of the community and the needs of the institution, but then how do we make sure that everybody at the college can take ownership and do their part in contributing to that work? Um, so we talked a lot about organizational, organizational success and defining that based on how we address the needs uh, on, of the community and our ability to measure uh, how we've addressed those needs and defining success uh, based on uh, how the people that come to us, employees, students, uh, community members, how do they come to us to accomplish something and do they are they able to do what they wanna do when they get to our doors? Uh, next slide, please. So again, reframing back to those questions that uh, we, we kept in mind throughout this whole process of the conversation uh, of who's not here, who could be here, 
and who's coming to us and is not being successful once they get here, not being successful at the same rate as others. Um, and those two questions are informed by the larger question of, are there groups of people who, are, who aren't being successful because of barriers that we can eliminate? What are the things that we can do and how can we assess those barriers uh, to act on those? Um, so with that, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, so that process led us to uh, Bob Hughes, who was a, our consultant, developed a template for us to help us through the process of uh, introspection and self-assessment uh, with the idea that every, every area, every unit, every department would go through this process to develop individual uh, work plans that would feed into the strategic plan, informed by the strategic plan. And um, that process uh, had these six steps that are listed on the page. And so I'll talk a little bit about those steps and how individual units have developed what we call their equity work plans. So the first question was defining what each department wants to learn or accomplish. That meant looking at the, the strategic goals and objectives and figuring out where their unit, their department uh, found the most alignment, figuring out where they could contribute the most and prioritizing that work. Um, and then in the second step, identifying where they are in succeeding. What are the barriers that are existing within that department that are hindering people from doing what they need to do? Uh, whether it's not being able to access it or accessing, but not at the same rate as others. Um, and both doing an internal look, uh, but also looking at what are the institutional barriers that were keeping individual departments maybe from doing what needed to be done. Um, and then also looking externally, what are outside barriers maybe that were affecting um, that access. Um, the third step, looking to see if there are groups of people who aren't being successful, narrowing down on those um, populations. Uh, once you've identified a potential barrier, the idea was that each department would try to identify groups who aren't succeeding, um, who are not participating in the same way, uh, who are not being um, attracted to the offerings of a specific program. Um, are, were there identifiable groups who were struggling uh, more than others? Um, and also who, who, who was succeeding, who were, what were populations that were succeeding at a higher rate so that we could evaluate and assess what we were doing for some populations and maybe not for others. And once we had a little bit of that, those numbers and that data, the, the narrowing down and actually discovering the experiences of those who aren't succeeding. There was a lot of conversation about going beyond the numbers and making sure that we were looking at uh, lived experiences talking to students, staff, faculty to understand um, what they had experienced, what they've been going through, to be able to interrogate our current practices that were creating inequities. Um, there was a lot of conversation here about being uh, vulnerable and being willing to question how we were doing certain things. Um, it, it is very easy, and we talked a lot about this, um, if certain populations are being successful through, through our services or through our programs, it's very easy to celebrate that. And that's a good thing to celebrate, but we need to make sure that we are not, um, that we're not creating barriers and who are we creating barriers for and may, being able to admit and accept that we were doing that and how we could fix and, and shift the way we were offering um, and putting forward our practices. Uh, there was a lot of conversation here too about being collaborative uh, being willing to talk openly and honestly about what, what were those barriers that were being identified um, and seeking solutions outside of individual units or departments, uh, acknowledging that there might be others that are have already been able to figure out how to remove some of those barriers and, and doing a better job um, of servicing all of our uh, students and community members. And then the that the fifth step after doing all of this analysis, not, so not jumping to solutions immediately, but being able to like process a lot of these experiences, then thinking about what are the potential solutions? Um, who can contribute to our solutions? Who could be a good partner for us and who can help us in, inform uh, better processes? Uh, and then the big, the big step of actually making the change. Um, after being vulnerable, which is a challenge, then actually being willing to make the change and stepping out of how we've been doing certain things. Um, and then the critical piece about um, what we do about education, uh, being able to measure and look what measure our success or, or, or our failure if we haven't been able to address the specific uh, barriers, 
uh, measure our outcomes, measure our outcomes along the way, um, and then go back and start the process all over, being able to identify um, what were what what other barriers, what are something that we didn't catch on the first go around, um, and continue to improve our, our services. Um, so as, as Nick was saying, we started this process last year. We did the, the, the development of the strategic goals and objectives during 2020, 2021, and individual departments uh, developed the equity work plans through the fall uh, of this year, 2021, and they've been implementing that work this year. Um, and now we're looking into our next steps. How can we continue to make adjustments to this work and what are next steps into the future? And I'll pass it back to you, Nick, for that. Thanks, Margarita. So the, we're, um, you know, one of the the downsides of, of such a short time horizon on our current strategic plan is like is that we're barely going to get any information out of out of the, the uh, evaluation elements as, until we're like into the next phase of planning for the upcoming the next round or cycle of of strategic planning, and so. Um, uh, you know, we're just going to, have to, you know, live with that. But um, as we begin to evaluate the work of the current strategic plan, we are going to embark on uh, launching um, the next cycle. Um, I believe um, later this summer will be opened up with um, with the president and and the board of trustees, and that will be. Um, um, far more comprehensive and, and deliberative than this current plan that we're coming out of. Um, and hopefully we'll, we'll be able to bring more people together to um, take part in the planning process. Um, you know, not only are those kinds of, I, I think the, those kinds of planning exercises are more um, effective or can be more effective face-to-face the thing that we don't get through this kind of environment is, is the incidental information that comes from side conversations and opportunities to, to explore a, a, an alternate path that might arise through side conversation and so on. So um, um, hopefully we're gonna have that kind of a face-to-face -face process in the next, in the upcoming year. And that's where we'll be doing, you know, a far more um, in-depth look at the college's um, vision, mission, and values. Um, we're doing more comprehensive SWOT analysis, having some evaluation from the current planning cycle to bring to the table, and we'll be doing um, um, our uh, campus climate assessment next fall. And we're also um, we just closed. We did the. Um, uh, the PACE survey, it, I don't know if everybody's familiar with the PACE survey, but we just completed the PACE survey uh, around employee, employee engagement and satisfaction. That also has a DEI component to that and um, should be getting the results of that probably like in June or July. So we'll be able to incorporate that information um, going forward. And then, you know, we won't be ready this cycle um, fully, but we will be able to probably, we're, we're talking about getting back in the cycle of doing, um, you know, the SESI or something equivalent for student engagement and um, getting back into that so that we have that data on hand as well. Because I think the last time we did that was May, oh boy, probably like 2016 or 17. So I feel like we've kind of, um, sort of slipped a little bit and then the pandemic really kind of knocked us off our block, but we're, we're coming back around to all this stuff now. Okay, then next slide. And then, you know, the, the other element here is that we um, wanna be sure that our, our institutional plan is, is um, aligned with an operationalized definition of mission fulfillment. And I think that's the, one of the hardest things that we do is like ask ourselves, well, how do we know we're fulfilling our mission? And and because in, in many cases we, we, we may have um, 
um, really kind of aspirational um, mission statements and and but they're very and they're good and they're, they they can um, capture the culture of the college and so on but they may also be very very difficult to really pin down and define and operationalize in a way that um, uh, sort of facilitates a, 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 a knowing of the level of mission fulfillment. Um, and so we're gonna be working on that as we go through our planning process. And we wanna ensure that you know, the work that we're doing here um, is also kind of informing that the formulation of mission and the way in which we evaluate that. And we, so we wanna ensure that we've got a, a through line, that we've got the tools and the information available um, for, you know, across the college for people to be able to access the uh, data and information and participate in that kind of evaluation. And, um, and then, you know, that'll feed into um, annual reporting and then a mission fulfillment reporting cycle that's going to be lined up with um, accreditation, um, which we have a, a visit from the Northwest Commission coming this fall. So I think that may be it, yes. Thank you so much, Margarita and Nick. Yes, any questions, thoughts, ideas? I saw one in the chat that was answered using the head survey for your campus climate assessment. Great, Jess. Thank you both for sharing. That was interesting to listen to. Um, did you find using the consultant was um, a, a positive addition to the process? Would you do that again? I I like using an external person to um, to facilitate the conversations. In when we did planning back in fourteen. We didn't use a consultant. We had an internal team that led the the, um, the participatory planning sessions and the community sessions. And I, I think it went well, but I, I'm sort of leaning now toward the value, appreciating the value that an external person brings to the table, um, mainly because I think, you know, if the president is in the room helping run the process, it's gonna, it taints the conversation, right? So you, it, with an external person, um, I think you might have a more honest conversation, especially if, you know, executive leadership isn't there or it's limited and, you know, there, there's ways to, to structure that process so that, you know, the information that um, is inputted in, into that process can be more a, a richer, I would think richer and probably a little more um, true, if you will. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I thank you so much for sharing. And, uh, um, uh, you know, it's clear that you've done such a deep and thoughtful process with your, your plans um, and, uh, I want to highlight a couple of things that I wrote down, which is that is um, uh, the, you know, using equity as a practice to collect and assess data. So instead of collecting everything and then throwing on an equity lens at the end as you're evaluating or assessing your data, making that entire process, that whole practice of, you know, planning and how to collect, doing the actual collection and then assessing it. Um, using that equity practice all the way through that process is really, really important. And folks now, I feel like in the last few years are, uh, are starting to come to that. You know, we, we got very used to our kind of first phase was the equity lens was just this like, well, now throw these glasses on and look at this existing thing through this lens. And now it's like, well, let's do a little bit better, not just a lens, but an actual embedded in the entire process. And so uh, uh, I like that you highlighted that 
piece. And then also um, that, that internal and external equity focus. And so uh, recognizing that all of your practices and processes and relationships uh, with external community, of course, need to also be grounded in equity. Um, of course, we know for students that's the case, but also um, com community members and the people we're serving, um, you know, right down to our literal neighbors of, for our campuses. Um, but also, you know, of course, um, uh, you know, the, non the nonprofit orgs and the advisory boards and the business communities and all of the folks, um, all of those uh, relationships also need to be grounded in equity. Uh, so I, I agree those are a couple of things I wrote down some more, but those are a couple of things that stuck out to me. So thank you so much. All right, anything else before we move to the last showcase from Everett? All right, so I'll move on. And I, I apologize, I will not do justice to Everett um, reviewing their information. They, the team realized kind of at the last minute that they had a conflict uh, with the, um, a college event that uh, they felt was important for their whole team to attend. And so uh, we said, well, well, we'll share your slides and we'll um, share what you've got. Uh, so on behalf of Phyllis and Andrew and Heather and Lisa, I will share their slides and we'll just go through. This will be pretty quick because I can't speak in detail, uh, but I think it still is important for us just to get the overview and the gist of their process. Uh, so they have um, a five-year uh, integrated strategic plan that includes um, uh, equity pieces. So their DEI plan is embedded. Uh, and on the next slide, they have two phases. So they were engaged in the strategic planning phase uh, from spring to fall 2021. And this included uh, getting input from stakeholders, of course, um, uh, so they were held sessions for campus leadership and employees, students and community members um, to help inform their strategic plan, which is another thing I wanted to mention um, from the other uh, colleges, Whatcom and Walla Walla too, is the, the significance of using the campus climate assessments and the employee uh, surveys and all of that, um, uh, all of those different data points and, and all the different types of information you can collect to inform the strategic plan. That's the idea. Um, uh, that's the idea behind the legislation as well, is that all that information that you gather is going to be used, of course, to shape your uh, strategic plans. Um, so that is, uh, of course, intentional for Everett as well. Um, and then drafting the plan with equity at the center um, as a campus community value. And the next slide uh, shows uh, the, um, the campus's uh, strategic priorities with equity at the center. And so we'll see in, in uh, a couple of slides how they are defining uh, their um, strategies, their career connectedness, their student readiness, sustainability and belongingness, and how they are uh, connecting those priorities, those strategic priorities uh, around equity. So the next couple of slides uh, share their mission and vision. Uh, and core values, and I won't read those to you, um, but of course you want those things in alignment. And also, as Walla Walla just highlighted, it is important to uh, periodically reevaluate your vision and mission and values because those can change. Um, and uh, so it's, it's critical to look at the alignment there and to make sure that the vision, mission and values are of course equity focused um, and that they are still relevant in serving the needs of changing populations and changing needs of the community. Uh, so those um, pieces, of course, I don't have to, I'm sure I don't have to remind anyone in this room too heavily uh, that you want those, those pieces aligned um, and very connected, of course. Uh, and then I think the strategic priorities slide, the next slide um, is where they uh, identify goals that went with those specific strategic priorities. So that uh, the graphic that had equity at the center and the four strategic priorities kind of swirling around it, they identified for each of the strategic priorities uh, specific goals that would speak to, to those. And so for belonging and creating that equitable campus culture where everyone is welcome and supported, 
um, outlining two goals that uh, meet that uh, priority. And then of course there are initiatives under those goals and there would be success metrics under those goals as well. Um, and so you can see this, um, the way that they have outlined their strategic plan uh, is kind of similar to the template that, uh, that our department at the State Board is providing for you for progress reports. And so very similar, identifying a goal or a priority and then having objectives and initiatives uh, underneath that. And so this is kind of a good general um, uh, outline and a good way to think about uh, how you might um, wanna shape your strategic plan. Uh, student readiness, again, identifying two goals that go uh, with making sure that their modes and systems of instruction and student services are equitable and accessible to all. And then the next slide, the, the next two strategic priorities with uh, the same elements, those two goals. And of course, you don't just have to have uh, one or two, as many goals as you want, uh, but of course, uh, something that is um, sustainable and something that can be well-resourced for your campus. Um, uh, and so for uh, Everett, these are the four pieces that they are really highlighting in their DEI strategic plan. Um, and again, embedded in their overall college plan. Uh, and so that was phase one of their work was uh, collecting that information from stakeholders, drafting the plan around those four strategic priorities. And then on the next slide, they will move into phase two, uh, which they're, um, they're in still now, winter and spring 2022. Um, and that is making sure that, uh, that um, the leadership team is securing executive support and sponsorship. Um, they're identifying guiding principles and using shared equity leadership framework. Uh, they are making sure to align the budget review process with the strategic planning process. Um, sometimes that piece gets overlooked or is an afterthought, uh, but the sooner, of course, that you can align those fiscal goals with your strategic planning, the better especially when it comes to equity, because a lot of times, uh, all of a sudden for equity work, oh, the funding's run out. So as much as you can prioritize that in the beginning uh, will be critical, of course, to the work. Um, and then work with extended leadership teams and student senate, uh, student leadership to identify and align activities and initiatives. Uh, again, um, trying to be as inclusive as possible of um, all of the members of the campus community, so including students. Uh, and then working with institutional effectiveness to identify uh, how the uh, college is making progress, looking at leading and lagging indicators, uh, and then creating a reporting out process to provide those reports to the Board of Trustees and the campus community. Uh, and one other element to keep in mind related to reporting or sharing of information is that um, for some elements of uh, Senate Bill 5194, uh, information must be public uh, or made public. And so for example, the DEI definitions that colleges are using uh, are to be published on the website. Um, and uh, for um, campus climate assessments for Senate Bill 5227, um, campus climate assessments are to be made accessible to the public. And so in, in your communication plans, when you're thinking about ways to communicate to your, not just your campus community, but also uh, further out to your external stakeholders and others, um, those publishing pieces uh, are important to keep in mind as well. Things that are going to be going to have to be made public um, on your web sites. So just want to put that reminder in uh, there. And so that is the very quick, and I apologize, uh, not doing justice to Everett's the Everett uh, team's work um, on their strategic plan, but at least it gives you a little bit of an idea of, of their approach and what they've been doing. Um, as I mentioned earlier, on the 23rd, when we do a repeat of this info session, the team will be, will be uh, available and will be able to present and answer any questions that you've got. But in the meantime, uh, if you'd like to reach out for anyone from, to anyone from their team, uh, here is their contact information. Uh, and again, these slides are available to you on the shared Google Drive. Uh, so that concludes that piece of our info session. And then I'll just open it up once again for any questions uh, for any of the colleges, uh, for Whatcom, Walla Walla, or Everett, or uh, for any of the state board presenters um, or thoughts. Open forum. 
as we wrap up here. Hopefully the information is helpful. It, sometimes it's it's difficult uh, when uh, because colleges have their own unique ways of doing things, which is fantastic. Um, uh, but it can sometimes be difficult to um, to try to maybe mix and match and see, okay, how could our college do things uh, and to kind of take lessons from other uh, institutions when there might be a really different approach. So sometimes it causes you to, to kind of stretch those muscles and think of some really different ways to do things, which is good, but can be challenging. Uh, all right, Ben, I see your hand up. Hi, uh, Ben Miller, Associate Registrar at Spokane Community College. Um, I, a couple of weeks ago, worked with the team here to put together our strategic equity plan. And one of the struggles that we had is that in the legislature, it talks about focusing on racial equity. And so we put racial equity first and foremost at the center of our strategic plan, but we couldn't resist the temptation to focus on the other types of equity that we're also very passionate about. And so we have this kind of issue where we are thinking about should we systematically expand that strategic plan to include those other forms of equity, or should we stick with focusing really on racial equity? And we're interested to see what other colleges are doing uh, about that challenge. I'm also interested to hear what other colleges are doing at that challenge. Um, uh, and I can't, you know, make a specific recommendation to you, of course, uh, your college needs to do uh, what is going to serve uh, folks best. However, uh, I will say, and we um, run into this at the state board as well with our vision statement, which is leading with racial equity. You know, we serve our communities and folks will push back against that. Uh, and, and we'll often say, well, there are other types of equity. So why is the focus on racial equity? I lean toward an absolute explicit focus on racial equity. Um, and I think it is completely appropriate for strategic plans, DEI strategic plans in particular to, um, to highlight racial equity specifically. The piece that I think is often missing with that is that folks, often don't understand that a focus on racial equity is a focus on all types of equity, um, not just because of intersectionality, but because of the skills and the um, tools that you learn in order to work at dismantling racial inequity uh, are the tools and strategies that apply to all forms of equity. And so that is often the missing piece when we're talking about um, uh, equities and, and inequities and folks maybe not understanding quite how why racial equity is highlighted. Um, and so as much education as you can do uh, around that piece, I think uh, would be really critical. Um, but I also Ben, am really, I'm so glad you brought it up. I'm really curious to see how other colleges will address that because you're right, the legislation does particularly uh, call out racial equity. I think with the understanding that that uh, the unsaid, unspoken understanding that that means a focus on all types of inequities. Uh, who else would like to add to this? It's a great question. I would like to chime in. And so I think one of the questions that pops into my mind it turns that into a question from a claim to a question, right? And so why, why the need to um, move away from the conversation of racial equity? Why the urge, why the agency to move away from the question of, of racial equity? Recognizing that most of our um, primary identities and our secondary identities that we identify for like federal and state reports, um, those students who are historically racially minoritized and silenced live at those intersections of multiple identities. And the fact that um, a lot of the work that has been done in racial equity has informed and supported the success of recognizing, for example, gender, um, accessibility, um, as well as recognizing even the religious aspects of the experiences of our students who live at the intersections of multiple identities with the primary one of race. I think as a researcher, I also want to call to attention that we have been having these conversations in higher education intensely for longer than I've been alive. And for some reason, 
<laughs> I'll just say it that way longer than I've been alive. And for some reason, no matter how we, we shake all the primary identities into, you know, into our hands as, as, as though we can just shake them and, and, and come up with equity, the conversation is always lagging when it comes to race. Race is usually that tense, uncomfortable spot um, that we sit with that and we have a need to deter from. And so, you know, I think part of the conversation is not why the focus on race. I would say why historically not the focus on race as a higher education system where that is so visible in our spaces and yet we've been able to close like when it comes to accessibility conversations we're now 100 percent there but we've been able to back those conversations with you know with the legal components with the data components with the offices with the mass support and i sometimes have to wonder as a person who has a physical and two learning disability needs how can we haven't been able to address racial equity in a similar manner when some of those regulations that are existing for accessibility stem from racial accessibility as well for our students, our faculty, and our staff members? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. When it has been, when race has been, um, you know, most of the time, the determinant uh, for uh, for access and outcomes and quality of life, you know, it, it must be addressed. It just must be. Yeah. The thing is that um, as a as a student that is in one of these boards, <laughs> of these equity teams, it is we can try, we can push, and policy moves extremely slow. But unless the community, unless, and I'm gonna say this so bluntly, unless the white people are ready. <laughs> we are not gonna get anywhere. And that's where it stands then, because not to point out the obvious, but who is running these programs, who is at the head of these programs, and it's not the person of color, you know? It's the predominantly white. So when we talk about race, people feel uncomfortable. And then it takes a long time, you know, because we don't wanna hurt people's feelings because we're tippy toeing on, the very big issue, right? That we're not confronting it. So let's talk about it, you know? Why is it not the focus? Because if we focus on race, then everything else gets fixed, right? It's like a domino effect. But because we don't want to focus on it, because we want to be sensitive about it, because we don't want to make Karen or, you know, Monica or who, you know, uncomfortable, we don't want to mention it and we don't want to speak out. That's why we're still here. That's why policies, we've been talking about race equity, and mind you, I am what, 40 and I'm a student now? And like she says, it's, it's been going on for God knows how long. And we're still, me being on these meetings, we're still not at a place where I can see that my kids are not gonna be discriminated. That's how sad it is. Thank you for sharing that, MJ. Yeah, I, um, it's, exciting to me as much work uh, as as always needs to be done it is exciting to me that we live in a state where this kind of legislation uh can be passed it's a challenge it's a challenge to to us and a mandate to us uh to keep doing really important work and man other states are well, just leagues behind us uh, so uh, you know at least it's good in that sense that there's a some structural support now you know there are always always um pitfalls uh to to systems and uh certainly our legislative system is uh is no different um but i take it as a sign of uh support for the work um and i think it's a good challenge to us and don't get me wrong, I'm so grateful because this is one of the few states that has actually brought it to the table. We're talking about it. There's legislation on it. While they're the state where I come from, Florida, <laughs> we're regressing. <laughs> so, you know, do feel proud, but I'm just saying there's still work to be done. That's all I'm putting out, guys. I'm very grateful and I'm very thankful for each and one of you that are here and that are putting your grain of salt here. Thank you.
I, I also come from Florida. So the oh. juxtaposition between working in Florida, Florida State University, and working here, um, you know, things that I do here that I'm required to do are things that would get me fired back in Florida, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And MJ, that my comment was not directed at you. You're you're spot on. So so we don't we don't have to we don't have to be grateful for crumbs. You know, uh, we we need to demand the robust transformation in education that we need. Uh, and I, I definitely don't mean we need to be grateful for every little tiny crumb, um, but um, I take it as a sign that we're moving in the right direction. So I appreciate that. Okay, anything else? I, so thank you so much, Ben, for that uh, question so that we could have that, that conversation. Uh, and it's a little bit after three, so it's okay if you have to hop off, but I do wanna stick around just for a little bit in case there are other questions or thoughts. Uh, for those of you who need to, to hop out of the room, thank you so much for attending. Really appreciate your engagement. And have a wonderful week too. Thank you so much always for inviting me guys. I appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate course. Kai for inviting me too. I'm so grateful. Um, and it's, I always learn something good. That's why I asked you for the slides. I was like, oh my God, this would be so great to share with the team. Absolutely. Um, especially because we are working on this and I felt like a little lost. And after coming, I feel like, oh, I get it now. I got it. <laughs> so now we'll take it back to the team and be like, hey, you guys need to pay attention a little bit more often. <laughs> right, right. Come to these meetings. They're amazing. Thank you so much. I appreciate you guys. Have a thank wonderful day. You. And enjoy You're the rest awesome, of the day. Thank No, you. thank you. You're awesome. <laughs> Bye. Bye.